First Peter chapter number 1. As Miss Noreen was testifying, I thought about a verse I'm about ready to read. Verse number 3 said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy... Boy, hadn't He showed that on us, huh? Yeah. According to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time wherein you greatly rejoice though now for a season if need be ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, this is the verse I thought of Miss Nordeen was testified, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we bless your holy name. We thank you for the good singing. We thank you for the good time of fellowship. We thank you for the good testimonies. God, thank you for watching out over your people. Lord, you promised to, but it sure is good hearing folks testifying that they recognize that it was your hand watching over them in their hour of need. God, thank you for the hope of revival. Lord, the way you've been stirring, the way you have been blessing, creates a lively hope within us that, Lord, you're going to do something supernatural far beyond our walls uh, that we can see it affect folks in this community, that we can see those that uh, now are lost will get born again. We can see those that are downtrodden be uplifted. We can see those that are seeking find. Uh, God, we can see you do a, a supernatural work, and our prayer is... Uh, that the world has to stop and take notice uh, that in all the wickedness going on, in all the peril, uh, in all the hardship, uh, in all the sickness, uh, there is a God in heaven, uh, and he's moving in Florence, Kentucky, uh, and he's still got a good word uh, for the sinner uh, that Jesus saves, uh, that Jesus saves. Uh, Father, we pray that you'd continue to orchestrate in our midst uh, You'd continue to arrange the atmosphere. Uh, you'd continue to touch hearts. Uh, you'd continue to use the saints of God. Uh, and God, you'd do something uh, that, Lord, we can't even comprehend uh, of how great and how mighty you are. Uh, we just have to sit back and witness it uh, and say, The Lord, uh, He is God. Uh, the Lord, uh, He is God. Uh, Father, I pray for Brother Bobby. I pray for Brother Greg. God, you'd continue to give them discernment. You'd continue to deal in their hearts. God, you'd use them as vessels, meat for the Master's use. Father, I pray you'd use whoever you desire to use, uh, whether it be in a song, uh, whether it be in a testimony, uh, whether it be through the avenue of prayer, uh, whether it, God, uh, 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 it would be someone else stand and preach. Uh, God, whatever you desire, uh, Father, that's what we desire. Uh, Father, we are nothing. Uh, we are a zero with the hole knocked out of it. Uh, God, we aren't worth anything uh, other than what you put in us, uh, other than what you've done for us. Uh, Father, we just want to see you high and lifted up. Uh, Father, we want to see you do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Uh, Father, we are uh, uh, claiming that verse that you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think. Uh, uh, Father, we are longing uh, uh, to see something we've only read about, uh, a move of God uh, that changes lives, uh, that sustains people, uh, that God saves people. Uh, God, that does something that you get glory for. Uh, now, Father, help us tonight. Uh, we need your touch. Uh, we need your help. Uh, God, I pray that, God, you'd speak. Uh, I pray that your people would embrace uh, and be found guilty of doing what thus saith the Lord. Uh, have your will and way now. We'll bless you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In First Peter chapter number 1, we find... Uh, some remarkable verses. 
uh, in a month of Sundays, we could never preach all the wonderful truths in this one chapter. But let me just give you a few things uh, uh, before I would get to the thought. I want you to notice in verse number 3, uh, Peter is talking about redemption. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope uh, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Uh, uh, look with me down uh, uh, later in the chapter. Uh, 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 he says this. Uh, 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 let me find it here. Uh, 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 he says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which, uh, live, uh, which liveth and abideth uh, uh, forever. Uh, 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 he says uh, uh, in verse 18, For as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold uh, from the vain conversation received by tradition of the fathers, uh, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish, without spot. Uh, uh, can I say, uh, uh, we were begotten, uh, my dear friends, by the Word of God. Uh, we were begotten by the Spirit of God using the Word of God. Uh, we were begotten, uh, uh, my dear friends, or born again uh, by being washed by the blood of God. Uh, hallelujah. We have a lively hope tonight uh, because Jesus is alive. Uh, if you're here tonight uh, and your hope's not lively, uh, I uh, highly recommend getting plugged into Jesus. Uh, well, realize what He's uh, done for you. Uh, hey, he died for you. He bled for you. Uh, he spoke to your heart uh, through the Word of God, through conviction. Uh, he rose again. Uh, and friend, He wants you to be uh, alive in Him. Uh, you ought to have a lively hope tonight. Uh, I'm so excited about revival meeting. I'm so excited. I'm giddy. I'm giddy. I'm like a kid on Christmas morning uh, uh, just because I know how good Jesus is. Huh? We see redemption. In verse number 4 we find uh, we have a reservation. Look what it says in verse 4. To an inheritance. He not only saved us. I mean if that's all he did was save us. Brother Phil. That that's all he did was save you so you didn't have to die and go to hell. We'd be without excuse uh, not to run laps, not to shout, not to exalt the Lord. Uh, I mean, we're saved. Hallelujah. Uh, uh, the sin has been washed. Uh, Brother Clint, uh, 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 hallelujah, the blood goes deeper than the stain of sin. Uh, hey, our old life was a stained garment of sin. A uh, uh, tide couldn't get it out. Uh, shout couldn't get it out. Uh, but the blood of Jesus Christ uh, clean cleansed us from all sin. Uh, hey, just being saved uh, is enough for us to worship and glorify God. Uh, but can I say, Jesus never does the bare minimum requirements. He's a lot better than we are. We try to do the least and expect the most from God. No, he said, oh, I saved you. And you ought to have a lively hope. Because here's why. Verse 4. Why did he save us? Huh? Mm, to an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Huh? Brother Peter, in glory somewhere, God's got an inheritance for you. Huh? Miss Brandy, uh, over on the streets of glory, uh, you've got an inheritance uh, just for you. Uh, Elf, uh, hey, I'll never forget that Sunday morning you got born again. Uh, hey, uh, you didn't know when you got born again all came with it. You was glad to be born again. Uh, you was glad to be redeemed from religion. Uh, you was glad you didn't have to go in a box and confess uh, and go out just as guilty as you came in. Uh, you took one trip to the altar uh, and you got clean. Uh, what a blessing. But you had no idea the moment you called on Jesus, uh, he reserved an inheritance uh, for you in glory. Uh, hey, uh, he gave you fill a title to a mansion. Uh, it's in glory. Uh, hey, we got a reservation. Uh, hey, uh, if all he did was save us, uh, if all he did was let us bow at his feet in glory uh, and kiss his feet, uh, that we didn't go to hell, that'd be enough. Uh, but Brother Tommy, uh, he said, no, no, no. Uh, he said, Brother, I got something even better than that for you. Uh, you've got an inheritance in glory. Uh, Hey, it's reserve, and it's not based on what stock market does. It's not based uh, on the gold standard. 
It's based on God's standard, friend, and it fadeth not away. Bless his holy name. Well, I might get to the message. Notice he deals with uh, a believer's readiness. Look what he says in verse number 5. I'm talking about us who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. You need to underscore that. And I know some of you, you know you saved. You remember when Jesus saved you? You just pray every day, you read your Bible, you come to church, you try to live for God. Uh, but still every now and then that monkey of a devil get up on your back, try to tell you not saved, uh, try to tell you you're living a lie, trying to tell you you're worthless, uh, trying to tell you God don't care about you. Uh, hey, the devil's a liar. Uh, uh, the problem is uh, sometimes we don't feel saved. Uh, sometimes we uh, just don't feel like uh, uh, God's hands on us. That doesn't mean we're not saved, friend. Uh, listen, there are some days you just don't feel good. Uh, our salvation's not based on how we feel. Uh, our salvation's based on faith. Uh, look what he said again. Get a hold of this. This will help you. Underscore it in your Bible. Write your name right next to it. Uh, he said, who are kept uh, by the power you holding on. Is that what it said? Uh, you're kept uh, as long as you can live it. Is that what it says? Now you're kept by the power of God through faith. Uh, unto damnation. Is that what it said? No. Uh, unto salvation. Uh, hey, uh, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, uh, that's what it took. Uh, and from then on, the power of God took over. Uh, he sealed you with the Holy Spirit of promise. Uh, and it's the power of God's mighty hand that keeps you saved. Uh, John 10, 10. Uh, uh, he's the door. Uh, uh, he's the shepherd. Uh, he said he'd come to give us life, life more abundantly. The thief coming up for to steal, kill, and destroy. He goes on to say down a few verses later uh, uh, that I'm in his hand. Uh, his hand's in the Father's hand. Uh, no man can pluck me out of the Father's hand. Uh, I'm kept by the power of God. But then it concludes that verse, ready to be revealed in the last time. Can I say this, neighbor? Wait till Jesus shows us off. God saved us. He's left us here to live for him and point others to him. But one of these days we're checking out of here. Uh, and when we, uh, when we do cross over, we'll be ready to be revealed because we'll be like him. Hmm? Uh, we see the readiness. Uh, I'm glad my readiness isn't contingent on how I'm doing today. I've been sealed unto the day of redemption. I'm kept by the power of God and I'm ready to be revealed when God pops me out of this flesh and gives me that glorified body. Well, I got to go on. Notice the rejoicing, verse 6. Wherein ye greatly rejoice. The Bible says right there, Peter is saying, if you realize you're born again and you've got that lively hope, and when you realize that you've got an inheritance that fadeth not away in glory, and when you realize you can't keep yourself, but God's keeping you saved. He says, you'll greatly rejoice. You know why some Christians don't rejoice? They don't get a hold of them three verses. When you get a hold of the fact you're saved, and you're really saved, and you really get to go to heaven, you'll rejoice. I was talking to one preacher this week. He's preaching revival uh, uh, up in Delaware. I didn't even know God knew where Delaware was. But he's up there in Delaware, and he's preaching. He said, preacher, I'm preaching my heart out. He said, and the pastor said, I'm really helping the church. He said, but you never know it by looking at them. Uh, I'm glad when you get a hold of it, on, even your face knows you're saved. Uh, uh, listen, you may not act like some of the fellows act around here, but if you're really saved, you're going to rejoice. 
you're going to be happy somewhere along the line. There'll be a smile on your face. There'll be a tear run down your cheek. Every now and then you might even lose your Baptist uh, ideology and raise your hand. I mean, who knows? He said, yay, wherein you greatly rejoice. Huh? We see the rejoicing. But then we see the restraint. We can't always be on the mountaintop. Look what happens. Though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptation. Manifold means a whole lot. Do you ever seem like you go through something and you just barely get through it and here comes something else and then something else comes, something else comes, and you're wondering, what in the world have I done against God? Hmm? Just a wave of adversity come against you. Well, it goes on to say this that the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perisheth though it be tried with fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ can I say this the most precious thing you have is your faith in Jesus Christ it's more precious than gold but your faith is worthless if it's not tested and sometimes God pulls back his hand and allows your faith to be tested sometimes it's manifold temptation and you have a trial and your faith is tried by fire I want to help you something nothing is ever set on fire and comes out looking the same as it did when it started under the fire hmm that fire never is pleasant. It burns, and it burns away things, and it strips things away from its original state. Can I say? Sometimes we are restrained. Sometimes we face trials, temptations, and tests, and problems, and heartaches, and hardships, and storms. We never, I've said this many times, we never get up and say, uh, Lord, let me stand in that cancer line today and get cancer. Huh? I hated you had cancer a couple years ago, but I'm glad you got a clean bill of health today. Amen. Huh? And I'll have to say one thing. Her faith through all that, it inspired me. Huh? And that's why God tries our faith. What did it say? to the praise, honor, and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. When your faith is tried and you still live for Jesus, you still greatly rejoice, you still are clinging to that faith in God above all other things, it inspires others and it shows others what you have is real. Hmm? I was talking to somebody this week that crowd that is always up and never has any problems and Jesus is wonderful every day and it's all rainbows and unicorns and butterflies and they're always woo, 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 woo. That crowd scares me. There's some days I'm on the bottom rung of the ladder. There's some days I have to, you know, look up to see the dirt. You know what I'm saying? That don't mean my faith isn't real. That don't make God any less in my life. It just means I am real. I worry about a crowd that's all the time. Acting like they don't have any problems. You know what they are? They're acting. Hmm? We see the restraint, but then we see the rapture. Now, when I'm talking about rapture, I'm talking about excitement. Look at verse number 8. Whom, talking about the Lord, having not seen, ye love in whom though now you see him not, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Friend, when God comes through and answers prayer, when God puts his hand on you and he touches your life, regardless of the trial, you find a rejoicing you didn't know you had. You become elated knowing that the Savior cares 
that the Savior's there, that He's not forsaken you, that He's not left you, that He does care. Well, all that's good preaching, but I'm not going to preach on any of that right now. I'm interested in verse number 16. Now again, I can't preach all the way up to this. I can't preach this whole chapter. It's, it's loaded. But I'm interested in verse 16. Peter, of all people, Sunday I mentioned he popped off at the mouth all the time. I identified with that Peter. I identified with the Peter that wanted to you know, crack out a sword and cut somebody's head off. I, I identified with that guy. I identify with the guy that's quick to... Uh, boast a lot of things without giving thought, you know, putting both feet in his mouth. I, I know that Peter. But the Peter who has been converted and God's done a work in his life to where he's writing this part of the Bible, this is a whole different guy. And this Peter says this, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Can I say tonight, there are a lot of people saved going to heaven, but they're mechanical Christians. My dog goes outside, does his business, comes in, I tell him to sit. He sits. You know why? Because he knows he's going to get a treat. There are people who come to church that respond in different things according to what they want in return. If their favorite song is sung, they're excited. If the preacher preaches hard, they go to the altar. When it's fellowship time, they'll shake hands and hug somebody's neck. But they do it mechanically. They don't do it because they were inspired by the Holy Ghost to do it. And the reason there are so many mechanical Christians who have been trained how to act in the house of God rather than come and worship in spirit and in truth is because they're not being holy. And I want to preach with God's help on being holy. Being holy. Now notice again this verse. I want you to get a hold of this. If you don't get anything else, get this. The Bible says, Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Now correct me if I'm wrong. It did not say obtain holiness. Does it say that? No. It did not say become holy. It said, Be ye holy. Holy. Our problem is, Brother Donald, we get to look at what we're made out of. And we get to looking at our faults and failures. And we'll fall back on what we're trained, mechanical. I fail the grace of God every day. Duh. We all do. But that's where we live. I could never be holy because I made a flesh and I fail God every day. I can ever get a, a, a halo of holiness uh, because I'm in the flesh. Do you think God doesn't know that? Then why would God command us to be holy if we couldn't be holy? You see, we fall back on the excuse, well, I can never become holy. That's not what he's telling us to do. We can never obtain holiness. That's not what he's begging us to do or bidding us to do. He says, be ye holy, for I am holy. Are you saved? Nobody saved here tonight? Are you saved? Amen. Does the Holy Ghost live inside of you? So God lives in you. And the same Holy Ghost that lives in you wrote the Bible. And he said, be ye holy, for I am holy. What is in you is holy. He didn't say become holy. He didn't say obtain holiness. He said be holy. You know what that simply means? That just simply means just do it. Just do what it takes to be holy. So with that in mind, I'm going to preach on being holy. 
How can I be holy? How can I do this be holy thing? Well, there's several things. Can I say, first of all, the way that you uh, be holy is you've got to have some holy tendencies. There's just some things you need to do because they're holy, and when you do them, you're being holy. Hmm? When you're hungry, if you eat, you're feeling the hunger. Well, when God says, be ye holy, He says there's some things you must do, and when you do them, in God's eyes, you're being holy. What is it? Well, first of all, by having holy aspirations, you're being holy. What is an aspiration? It's a heartfelt desire. When you have a heartfelt desire for holy things, God looks at you as if you're being holy. Are you in your flesh holy? No. But are you being holy? Yeah, you're aspiring holy things. You have a desire for holy things. And when you are desiring holy, you are being holy. Let me help you something. If you're desiring holy, you're not going to be living wickedly. Hmm? When you're desiring wickedness, you're not going to be living holy. Does that not make sense? Well, what are these aspirations? Well, you need to have a heartfelt desire for repentance. You see, we love. Lord, bless me. We love. Lord, thank you. We love. Lord, it's good for us to be here. But what we really don't have a desire for is to be clean in the eyes of God. To repent. The only way you'll ever be holy is if you have a desire to be clean. And the only way you'll ever be clean before God is having a heartfelt desire for repentance. Well, what do I have to repent from? First of all, sin. Y'all admitted, well, I can't be holy. I fail the grace of God every day. Well, you got room to repent then. Mm. Need to repent of sin. We need to ask God to show us anything He's not pleased with in our life and then ask Him to forgive us with the intent that when He shows it to us and He forgives us, we turn from it. That's repentance. We need to repent of sin. Of things that displease God. You'll never be holy when you're living a life that does not please Him. Can I say this? We need to repent of self. The reason we're not, we're not holy and the reason we become mechanical is we let self drive us and not the Holy Ghost. Amen. There are so many people that they are mechanical because they're motivated by self because they want attention. How many times have you heard me say God doesn't share His glory with anybody? Hmm? Where's all that shouting that went on when I was talking about being saved? Oh, we get talking about living holy, it gets real quiet. You know what you're doing? You're telling on yourself. Or you're listening real good, and that's the important thing. That you listen and you start doing so we can be holy. Hmm? We've got to repent of self. Not I, but Christ that liveth in me. Are you listening? It's all about Christ. Uh, well, preacher, I want to testify. Well, what does God want? I don't care what you want. Hmm? Do you know how many people I've made mad because I've walked into the sanctuary after praying in my office and seeking the Lord, and I walk in here and somebody walks up and says, I got a song tonight. Well, good. Well, let's see what God says. And I make them mad. I don't say that, Miss Mary, but I make them mad when I don't call on them because God didn't tell me to call on them. Then they get mad and they don't come for three or four services. And we have good services when they're not here. Because self got out of the way. Listen, I've had preachers tell me this week, well, preacher, God's a move. Why don't you preach revival? Because oh, I need revival. But it's not about me. I, I really don't care. I don't care if God calls somebody in the midst of us and then preaches on the rest of the week. I really don't care who God preaches. I want to see Jesus. I lift up. It's not about Doug Foster. It's about Jesus. It's not about self. We need to repent of that. We need to repent that, Lord, forgive me of my selfish ways. Matter of fact, a lot of you have been praying for revival and you've been praying selfishly. 
You've been praying that God would set in and bless us. Well, He's blessed us so good. We, we, we don't need to pray that prayer. We need to pray God send revival that sinners outside this building get saved. That homes outside this building that are broken up get mended. That uh, 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 government officials outside this building that have been against the church get born again and start being for the church. Uh, uh, we need to start praying that the riots uh, turn into praise and worship of Jesus. Uh, we need to pray that God infiltrates this world uh, and changes lives. Not bless us. Man, we're so blessed. Every one of us put on weight during the virus time. We need to repent. I'm talking about a heartfelt desire, not just to uh, run into an altar and say, God, forgive me. I'm talking about where you get so sick of your humanity being in the way of God. Repent of sin, repent of self, and repent of our slothfulness. I heard a song this week, and it said... What happened if God said, no, I'm not going to forgive you of your shortcomings no more. No, I'm not going to show up in your storms anymore. Uh, no, I'm not going to show up when you have needs anymore. No, I'm not going to care anymore because you haven't cared for me. Where would we be if God treated us the way we treat Him? Hmm? I preached a message one time, what if God blessed you for the last thing you was thankful for? We need to repent of our slothfulness. There's too many people already in hell because we've sat by idly just asking God to bless us instead of taking the gospel to a lost and dying world. I'm talking about being holy encompasses having holy aspirations, a heartfelt desire for repentance. The Apostle Paul said this in Romans chapter number 7, verse 18, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, uh, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more that I do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity the law of sin which is in my members. Uh, o oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Uh, that's the kind of repentance I'm talking about. And if the Apostle Paul lived that life and says that, how much more should we say that? Talking about a heartfelt desire for repentance. A heartfelt desire for the regeneration of sinners. We need to get it so broken for lost people. On Wednesday nights and years gone by, we've, we've taken prayer requests and just about every family in here requests prayer for somebody that's lost. I'm glad you request prayer. I'm glad you trust in your brothers and sisters to be able to call on heaven. But when's the last time you wept over their souls? You know when you're holy? When you're concerned about the things God's concerned about. And Jesus came seeking to save that which was lost. It's God's will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I'm talking about holy aspirations. Not only a, a heartfelt desire for repentance and regeneration of sinners, but also a heartfelt desire for revival in the church. Revival is more than just having a meeting. Revival is more than just having a good time. Revival is putting the church back to what the church was supposed to be. A soul-saving station where people come to pay adoration to God, get full of God, and go out and tell sinners Jesus saves. God help us to have true Holy Ghost sent revival. I'm talking about being holy. It starts by having holy aspirations. Then you've got to have holy actions. You say, well, what can I do that's holy? Well, this chapter gives us those holy actions. First of all, we need to be holy in our conduct. Look in verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. That word gird means fortify. Brother Kevin said it tonight. 
has been battling in his mind. That's where the battle always is. The devil will attack you. The devil will tell you all kinds of lies. He'll tell you how worthless you are and how God can't and how you won't and all this other junk. He's a liar and the father of it. You need to fortify your mind. How do you do that? By keeping it on Jesus. By keeping it in his book. He said, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. That means be clear-headed. And hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you by, at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. So how, how can I have holy actions? Be obedient. What's our one rule around here? Mind the Lord. Well, you need to do that. That means if he says go to the altar, go to the altar. I don't care if he wants you to go to the altar during announcements, even though we're not doing announcements anymore. You go to the altar. Uh, if he wants you, uh, 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 why preaching's going on, slip out of the sanctuary and get to Sunday school and pray for the power of God to fall on the man of God, you do that. Whatever he says, you do. Amen. That's holy actions. We need to be holy in our conduct. We need to be holy in our conversation. Look in verse 15. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Uh-oh. How's your conversation been? Amen. Has it been holy? Has your conversation... How you've conversed with people either in speaking to them or in emailing them or in your social media outlets or every other way you converse with people has it glorified Jesus? Talk about being holy. We're to be holy in our conduct by being obedient, by fortifying our minds so we can be obedient, so we can hear the voice of God, and then also in our conversations. But we're also to be holy in our actions in compassion. Look at verse 22. Seeing you have purified your souls in what? Obeying the truth through the Spirit. Isn't that what we just talked about? Minding the Lord, being obedient. Amen. Unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Fervent means power in action. We're to love the brethren with an unfeigned love, and we're to do it with a pure heart fervently. That means we are to love them and give them the benefit of the doubt even if they don't deserve it. We're to esteem them better than ourselves. We're to forgive them. We're to long to forgive them. We're to run to them and express our heart's desire for them is the will of God. Amen. We're to show love to the brethren with a pure heart. That's being holy. That's holy actions. Not only having holy aspirations and holy actions, we need to have a holy attitude. Boy, it's, it's hard to keep good attitude all the time. So how do you have a holy attitude? Well, Paul tells us when he wrote to the church of Philippians. Philippians 2, verse 5, Let this mind be in you. Well, if this is the attitude I need to have, I better, I better pay attention. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. You become nobody. You decrease. Let Jesus increase. That's, that's having a holy attitude. Are you listening? He took upon him the form of a servant. He didn't need to be seen. Matter of fact, many times they bid him to uh, uh, boldly come out and tell them he was the Christ. He said, if my works haven't testified of me, I do the works of the Father. He wouldn't come out and tell them they, that he was the Christ. He showed them he was the Christ. Hmm? He said, he took upon him the form of a servant was made in likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Our attitude is, Lord, thy will be done, not mine. 
That's a holy attitude. It goes on in verse 12 of Philippians 2. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That is not saying work to be saved. That is saying what God has put in you, that holy thing. Work it out through your life with fear and trembling. Your attitude ought to be, who am I that God would save me? I better do what God says for me to do. It goes on to say this, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and do of his good pleasure, do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebu rebu rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I am not run in vain, neither labored in vain." My dear friends, when we have an attitude, not I but Christ, and we decrease and he increases and we take on a form of servant, we don't want any notoriety and we exalt him in our life and our attitude and our actions, guess what? We shine as lights in this dark world. Have any, has anybody been paying attention? This world's gotten real dark real quick. You know what they need to see? Jesus. And can I say, Jesus isn't going to write his name in the sky for them to see it. He's written it in our hearts. And when we are holy, they'll see it. Being holy, not only in our aspirations and our actions and our attitude, but being holy in acknowledgement. My dear friends, Acts 4.13 says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceive that they were unlearned and ignorant men. That's, isn't that what they think we are? They think we're a bunch of deplorable ignoramuses that don't understand and you know we don't believe in Darwin and all the scientific method. We have to depend on a fi fictional character out there, a fictional Santa Claus who's going to help us and take care of us. That's what they think. But look what it goes on to say. They marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus you see when we are being holy the world will acknowledge that now listen I've read this quote today people can deny what we believe but they cannot deny how we behave and when you are holy they cannot deny that they may not believe in God. They may not, may not believe in what we're doing. They may think that we're being unsafe and assembling. They may say whatever they want to, but one thing they cannot deny is that we've been with Jesus. When you are being holy. Let me say this. When you are being holy, you will have a holy audience. You realize when you pray... When you praise Jesus in your private life, in our corporate worship, and in your everyday life, do you realize when your pursuits are holy, it's all being noted? Hebrews 12, 1 says, Wherefore, seeing as we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You know what the writer of Hebrews is saying? All of the glory world is taking note. And realizing that, we should pursue holiness. We should be holy. And when we pray, they'll note that we're praying for holy results. When we praise, they realize we are doing that because of the holy indwelling. And when our pursuits, our aspirations are seeking after Jesus, they take note of that. We have a holy audience. No man lives unto himself, no man dies unto himself. We are all written epistles known and read of all men. Men are taking note, but so is the glory world. The Bible says the angels look in unawares why God would love us. Think about that, Brother Clint. Somewhere up there in heaven, there's an angel who is in the presence and the glory and the holiness of God. 
and seeing all the abode of God and then they look over the banister and they look at you and they look at me and they think why did Jesus die for them shouldn't we show them that maybe we don't understand why he died first too but we sure do appreciate what he did for us and our life should be a life that emulates what he's done for us we do that by being holy now let me say this I'm about done Phil's about to pass out over there <laughs> he just got it he's a little slow he's a welder bless God sometimes the sparks don't get all the way to the brain you know what I mean listen I know I, I, I've studied this it's not easy being holy. But it's worthwhile. And you can be holy. Because of what is in you. You can be holy. You've got to condition your mind. I'm going to be holy or die. You've got to put into practice. Being holy. And if you're willing to be holy. You'll get there friend. God will wink at your ignorance when you're not doing it exactly the way that it needs to be done, but when you're striving to, because God sees the intents of your heart. But listen to me. Take note. Not maybe. Not might. Mark her down. There will come an attack to halt holiness. Mark her down. The devil don't care you come to church. The devil don't care if you shout while you're in church. The devil don't want you to live holy outside of church. The devil's afraid that something will spark in your heart when you're in church and it clicks and you become that peculiar generation Jesus is seeking after. You'll be holy and it scares the devil to death. Because he's seen what Jesus did with 12 men and one of them was of the devil. He utterly quakes in fear of what God would do with a whole congregation being holy. He really does. And there will be an attack against holiness. How's, how, how does the attack come? Does the devil wreck your car? Does your washing machine break? Does your refrigerator go out? No. That's all man-made mechanical stuff. That is just agitations of life. Job says man's days are few and full of trouble. You live long enough, something's going to go wrong. That's not an attack against holiness. See, the devil's far more crafty than that. And if that's what it takes for you to quit being holy, you wasn't holy in the first place. Hmm? Holy people step over that stuff. They recognize for what it is. So where does the attack come to keep you from being holy or get you to quit being holy? Well, it's found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. See, why you're being holy, you're being obedient. When you quit being holy, it's because you started grieving the Holy Ghost and you're being disobedient. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now here's how he attacks holiness. And here's what will stop you from being holy. Verse 31. Let all bitterness. Can I help you something? You can't be holy if you're bitter. If you've got an ought against a brother or sister, or you've got an ought against a co-worker, you've got an ought against somebody, if you've let something eat at you for years and you've gotten bitter and angry and, and just nasty in your spirit against something, you can't be holy. You know what they said about Jesus? Pilate said, I find no fault in him. There was no guile in his mouth. Amen. said, let all bitterness and wrath... Hmm? You know how to quit being holy? Be nasty. Get angry. You won't be holy. Hmm? Look what else it says. And anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. 
Those things are what is an attack on holiness. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, malice, all that grieves the Holy Ghost and it attacks holiness. Hmm? I promise you. And the next week, you're going to find yourself feeling like you're getting angry and really don't even know why you're getting angry. It's an attack against holiness. Somebody cuts you off in traffic and you not only horn cuss them, you want to run them off the road. That's so out of your character, unless you're me. Why? It's an attack on your holiness. Amen. You'll find yourself wanting to talk about a brother or sister in Christ and don't even know why you're doing it. It's an attack against holiness. All those things are set up to keep you from being holy. Now listen to what verse 32 says. Again, this is how you be holy. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. That's when you're being holy. When you're kind, when you're tender hearted, when you forgive one another, when you love one another, when you're excited to see one another, when you, uh, uh, you pray one for another, when you talk good about one another, all those things is being holy. You see, being holy is not some superstitious, supernatural fire from the sky thing. It's just being a Bible Christian. Just doing what the Bible says. You're being holy because you're being obedient to the things of God. In all of this, when the devil starts attacking, don't give an occasion for the flesh to rob you of being holy. The greatest example in the Bible. See, when you give flesh an occasion to hinder, it'll hinder, it'll, it'll attack your holiness. The greatest example in the Bible, Daniel chapter 6, verse 4, Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel. And then now what the devil does, he's accuser of the brethren. He's looking to find fault in you so he can go tell the, devil, go tell the Lord, Lord, they're not being holy. The devil's a big tattletaler. The presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find no occasion nor fault for as much as he was faithful, obedient. Neither was there any error or fault found in him. You say, what was Daniel being? Holy. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. You know what the devil ought to find when he comes attacking? No fault in us because we're doing what God said. So then he's got to attack God for what God said. Because all we're doing is what God said. Listen. God knew you couldn't keep the law in order to be saved. That's why he died for you. But he did know you needed the Holy Ghost of God to live in you so you could be holy. And you can be obedient. Obedience is simple. The Lord says do, do. The Lord says don't, don't. It's real simple. And the Holy Ghost in you will help you do or don't. But it all starts with, I want to be holy. I don't want, we want to pray like David, Lord, see if there be any wicked way in me. And then repent of it. And then aspire for what God wants. And being holy. And aspire to see people saved. Wouldn't it be wonderful seeing Christana saved this week? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful to see Randy come get saved? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful to see your children come get saved? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Huh? And we can go on and on and on. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Well, it all starts with us being holy. Because I promise, when you seek God in that manner, you know what God does? He says, wow, I've been waiting so long for somebody to stand in the gap and make up the hedge. Here's some wanting to be holy. Well... They want to see somebody saved? Done. They need somebody to get touched? Done. Somebody needs to get healed? Done. Somebody needs a better job? Done. Somebody needs some needs met? Done. 
You want revival to continue? Done. Huh? What, what's your heart's desire? Does he not say he'll give you your heart's desire? When does that happen? When do we get the heart's desire? When we're holy. Because when we are being holy, that touches God's heart. Because we are then dependent on God. We are not living selfishly and seeking selfish motives. Oh, selfishly do I want to see revival? Yeah. Because I just want to be in one. I just want to get close to him again, close enough to smell him. I do. But what I've been doing is I've been trying to strip me away. And I want revival because that's what God wants. And I wonder tonight, will you be holy? Will you be holy? Will you come face to face with God and say, God, I'm not holy, but I want to be holy. God, I want you to be pleased in my obedience. Will you be holy? Will you get beyond just revival and revival meeting and get beyond you know, problems and what you need from God? Will you get to where you say, God, I want to please you. I want to be holy. Because he said, be ye holy for I am holy. Do you want to please God? It starts with being holy. Will you be holy? Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. Father, thank you for the word of God. Lord, you do not ask a great significant thing for us. Lord, the Bible says the ways of a transgressor is hard. You said, come unto me, and I'll give you rest. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Father, you just ask us to be holy. To have holy aspirations and holy actions and a holy attitude where we're acknowledged for what you've done in our lives. Where we have an audience with the King of Kings and all of glory. Lord, where we can withstand the attack because we're walking hand in hand with thee. Lord, I pray that God, folks, will get beyond just having a good meeting. Get beyond having good services. But Lord, they'll reach for the next plateau. They'll do something with what we've experienced. And that's long to be obedient. And long to be holy. Lord, to long to please you. Because Lord, you certainly have pleased us. Now Lord, speak to hearts. Help us to strive for nothing less than Jesus and his righteousness. God, grant now the desires of the hearts of your people who desire to be holy. God, help us to impact this world, make a difference one soul at a time. God, we pray for Holy Ghost conviction and power that transforms people and creates in them a desire to be holy. Bless now. Deal with hearts. And help hearts to deal with you. We'll bless you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.